plenary speaking sessions at the same time. So it's a, a change for us. And uh, happy that those of you are able to come. Um, before we before we get into our speakers, let me just say a few things, uh, both on by way of some announcements that we need to be sure about. Uh, tonight, the Singapore Flyer is the host country welcome session. The buses will leave from the convention center here at 5:30 sharp. The last, the very last bus will leave at six o'clock tonight. So if you're not on the six o'clock bus, you'll have to get there on your own. Um, and the meeting is here at level four at the convention area to assemble for the, the bus transport to the flyer. It is still possible to register for the yellow ribbon run that is next Sunday. Uh, so please do so if you, if you are interested in that. And also for the prison visits, uh, up through tomorrow morning, uh, people can still register for the prison visits. So uh, that will be cut off uh, tomorrow morning. Our session has a focus that is really a landmark for ICPA those of you who have been to a number of ICPA conferences understand that. You have seen our past and you have seen, as Zed Wozniak so well explained this morning, uh, has always been much more prison focused for us. But with what we have seen in, in Singapore, what has happened in Singapore over a number of years now, the change here is something that made a great opportunity for the ICPA to come here as opposed to any other place uh, this year. Um, on a personal note, um, I first came to Singapore in 1989 at the invitation of then Director of Prisons T. Tua Ba. Uh, he was seen, I saw him on the television in the U.S. And I saw him speaking about the idea that the Singapore Prison Service needed to come into the 20th and the 21st century and modernize itself. It was uh, quite interesting to hear him talk about that. So he, Tito Ba was uh, a very special person. He uh, was a visionary person and he really, I think, kind of started the ball rolling here in the late 80s and early 90s to bring about an incredible amount of change. Those of you who have been to Singapore in the past know some of the history, perhaps, uh, the old Chengi prison, the colonial prison here, and then in addition to that, a number of old British uh, officers barracks that were used for drug rehabilitation centers and other prisons in some cases. Uh, so Director T saw the need to do something different, and what he started with was looking around the world to see what everybody else is doing in corrections. And that is something that Singapore tends to do. Those of you who, who know Singapore, those of you from Singapore, I think a very smart uh, way of doing things is always taking a look at what else is going on elsewhere. And Director T chose to come to the U.S. and, and see what was going on there, and he traveled to other countries as well. And so it was in the early 90s that all of that started. And when you consider, in addition to that, the fact that the nation that we're in, the nation of Singapore, only became an independent nation in 1965. And you obviously see the economic miracle that's here in such a short period of time. But it's, it's the social miracle and the cultural miracle that I think is just an incredibly important lesson for all of us. When you consider an island nation of about 716 square kilometers, it's about 20 kilometers by 38. There's five, over five million people here now in Singapore. Uh, it's, it's to me amazing when you consider especially the multicultural nature of Singapore and the peaceful coexistence that goes on here. There's a whole lot of things to learn from Singapore, not only 
about their economic success, but POW cultures from many different places on such a small place can peacefully coexist and get along. So I, I think that has something to do with the success that they've had in their prison system because of the leadership here that is able to take a look at what else is going on elsewhere and yes, maybe not reinvent the wheel, but in doing so, they're very careful to look at how does it fit in our culture, what doesn't fit in our culture, and take the best of it and reinvent in their own way uh, some of the best practices that we've seen now, especially in the Yellow Ribbon program. Ed Wozniak said it so well, there's, there's not much to add to what he said, but it has been in such a short period of time here in, in less than 20 years, what has come from old colonial prisons, old officers' barracks, to very contemporary facilities that are now very much focused on going beyond the prison walls and, as they say, unlocking the second prison. They are involved in developing uh, new modern pre-release facilities, re-entry facilities, um, day reporting centers, those of you from Western countries and, and other countries uh, know some of those terms well and, and have seen that. So there's a tremendous kind of coalescence, if you will, or convergence of ideas that you can see in Singapore that you can see in other parts of the world too. Uh, but the time in which they've done it, the speed has just been incredible here. Um, we have two speakers today. Uh, the, the agenda has changed a bit, um, and so we will take about 40, 30 to 40 minutes with each. Um, our first speaker will be from Singapore. Uh, Timothy Leo is the chief psychologist for the SPS, the Singapore Prison Service. Uh, Tim uh, is a native of Singapore. He uh, got his master's degree here. Uh, went to New Zealand and got involved in corrections in New Zealand, actually uh, clinical practice there with the prison service, but then came back to Singapore, back home, and, and today heads a team of over 80-some uh, counselors and other psychologists in the system and is going to talk about us, talk to us about, in his words, what works from the offender's perspective. Timothy. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as you can see, I am uh, not a Norwegian. Um, unfortunately, um, the previous speaker couldn't make it for this slot, so I was given kind of last minute notice to say, hey, do this slot. Um, thank you, uh, Robert, for your very kind and praiseworthy words for Singapore. Um, Today, what I'd like to do is to share with you a journey. Uh, I use the journey metaphor because I think that uh, as a system, Singapore has gone on a journey, and with that journey, the prison officers, the administrators, the specialists, our community partners have gone on this journey in the last 10 years, and we're still learning. Um, and interestingly enough, the people that are caught up in the journey are also the inmates under our care. And in some ways, this journey metaphor is something that I'll return to, um, which is really part of my talk. So the first part of the talk is really about, a little bit about Singapore's own journey, how we try to make sense of what, what the literature is saying to us, what we should be doing, but also being open to experiences that have not, that's not been written about, um, based on our own uh, internal sense of values. Uh, so this really sharing is really hopefully some of what I share or most of what I share will resonate with your own experience or where you are going with your service and with the people that you serve and try to help. Generally, um, Singapore started going on the rehabilitation journey in a much more systematic way. Sometime in the year 2000, uh, we had the uh, opportunity to learn from, uh, I think, James Bonter and um, Don Andrews with regard to the RNR model of rehabilitation. So that started off go going in the year 2000, around that time, and we started using the LSIRR, 
uh, as a classification instrument, uh, normed it on our local population, and then started to carve out criminogenic programs, as what the evidence say, should be working to reduce recidivism among offenders. However, the RNR part and the introduction of a evidence-based approach to rehabilitation didn't take place as a standalone uh, change process within the Singapore prisons. Um, at that time, the prison system went through a revisioning process that involved all the prison officers, all the staff members, even the, those who are doing corporate support services. And as a result, um, the staff themselves came up with a vision to be captains in the life of offenders. And I think the, uh, that visioning process brought about a, an energy that never was there, at least not brought together within prisons. And I joined prison service in 2001, and I, I must say that when I joined, I felt there was an energy that a momentum, like a kind of a rebirth, a, a renaissance in the prison system. With that came the motto, Renew, renew Rehab, Restart. Um, um, as the motto in which everyone on came together to try and make sense of what we are doing and to make a difference in the life of the offenders and also to make the workplace something that people want to come to work. Um, there was a concept called circle of influence and the ripple effect. And if, if you know, if you throw a, a stone into a pool, uh, a stagnant pool, you, you find ripples moving out in concentric circles. Well, the prison officer is seen as the person, or the prison staff is seen as the person that will be right at the one that's going to throw the stone in and become the, the ripple of influence. That kind of concept actually caught on quite a bit, and there was a lot of organizational learning that we did as a group to try and look at how we, no matter where we are in the system, are you in logistics, are you in the housing unit, or are you a staff officer at HQ doing policy work? How can all of us work together to bring things about? Um, so rehabilitation for us took place within an era of great change. And I think some of the officers who have been with us for many years kind of split into two groups. One kind of looked at it, perhaps a bit cynical. Another really was really quite enthused because many joined the service trying to make a difference. But sometimes in the custodial nature of our work, we end up not doing as much as we would like to. So this change movement brought about quite a bit of uh, momentum within our midst. The formation of the care network was uh, something quite visionary, I think, during that time where um, prisons and SCORE brought together all the NGOs as well as certain government, other government agencies into a network. And that network provided a means in which we can collaborate between each other. And over the last 10 years, the network has actually developed in terms of mutual trust between different volunteer groups with prisons, understanding our language, understanding our challenges, them challenging us with their questions. Uh, so that dialogue really was helpful. And one thing that I learned over the years is we, we can never quite get there. Um, this whole journey has been a bit of a learning and for prisons as a system, you know, prisons have always, uh, I think in most countries is the same. You have a lot of control over the inmates. You control discipline. You control the possibility of a riot. So every time you open the door to let someone in into your sacred space, so to speak, you take a risk. And this last 10 years has been a whole series of risk taking. Uh, of course, the, uh, one of the most pivotal things was the Yellow Ribbon Campaign. I wouldn't talk too much about it because you'll be hearing quite a bit about it during the conference. But that was another major shift in the way we looked at uh, our own movement. Now, at that time, uh, we didn't have a theoretical framework other than R&R &R to, to guide our rehabilitation. But along the way, we met people like Tony Ward, who uh, most of you would probably know. He's the author and the person that put together a good life model. Uh, interestingly, much of what Tony was trying to put across to us in terms of GLM uh, resonated with where we were going in terms of all the organizational movements that we we're doing. It helped us to see that, you know, 
uh, it put words into what we we're trying to do, uh, which was to engage our offenders to look at their lives. So this idea of a cap being captains of lives sounds rather noble, but it, we need a way in which we can engage offenders to look at themselves and to realize that there is help for them. So while we were plotting along, building up the prison system, Good Lives came. Uh, we found it very hard to operationalize Good Lives as you would in the r and framework uh, with the LSI, the classification of people into high and low risk. But the concept nevertheless remained as part of our imagination of how we should make our system better. We also came across some studies uh, by Shad Maruna on the systems. And what really captured some of our imagination among some of us was this Liverpool desistance study where he looked at how uh, offenders who make good in their lives were very different in the way they described themselves and look at themselves uh, from those who come back to prison. And so that kind of uh, helped us to rethink, is there something you can learn from the systems research that can actually help our rehabilitation journey better help us to be more effective. Um, I am just met uh, Professor Fergus McNeil yesterday, and I'm pretty, we're pretty indebted to some of his writing, uh, where, because he's put together the desistance literature and trying to integrate quite a large piece of work of different pieces of research and thinking uh, and integrate it in such a way that when, you, when I read it, I, I understand desistance better because I'm not an expert in this. But the systems research has actually helped us and challenged us to look at the journey from prison into the community belongs to the offender. How can we see, what can we learn from the offender's perspective, from their experiences, in their efforts to make good that can then inform our practice? So this really is what my sharing is all going to be centered upon. Maruna and, um, had put kind of uh, divided desistance studies into two areas. Uh, one primary desistance, which really looks at the act of stopping crime, more or less in terms of when people stop offending. Well, that's very important because it does tell us something about the way people desist the periods in which they might desist. But probably for the rehab practitioner, what really is very interesting for me anyway is secondary desistance. And the term secondary desistance talks about process, that desistance is not something that usually happens for people that suddenly today I stop offending and I live a crime-free life. It talks about desistance as a zigzag process, going back and forth. And the idea of people gradually drifting out of crime. I know some people will desist the first time they come to prison, but there are many who are repeat offenders who don't just stop. Just like, you know, if you're trying to give up smoking, you know, it can be a zigzag process, a drifting in and out of smoking, and suddenly you stop, you know? Uh, so what can we learn about this? What is the purpose for us of uh, the value of understanding the systems. We got the RNR, which is really, already is part of our system. One thing I realized talking and also sharing among correctional uh, officers is sometimes you see, say as a <coughs> prison officer, you see people coming back to prison. You don't really see the success cases unless you meet them on the road. So what that tells over time is sometimes you get a certain pessimism that starts to build. You know, This guy told me that he's going to go straight, and then six months later, it's back. And what I think desistance studies might contribute to us is, because quite a lot of desistance work also use qualitative approaches to getting accounts from offenders, is to understand that the offenders have a story. And individual stories, as well as collected stories, bring about research themes that if we bring it to the attention of our officers, then they realize that actually there's a lot of people that are making good. And these people are out there. And when a correction officer can read a story, he can relate it 
to, to himself and his work because it may not be that particular chap that he had served, but he probably recognized similar kinds of stories among the people that he, had, he comes into contact with. So I think, at least for staff, understanding the systems also helped them. The process, the secondary desistance approach, will also help our correctional officers to, to understand that the journey is not a straightforward one, but a zigzag one, how they can actually improve on the way in which they can manage our offenders, especially also those who go into the aftercare portion when they leave prison. I think this system's got a lot to add to shaping public opinion. Uh, if we can, there are people in the public, uh, they're not convinced by a 5% drop in recidivism. I mean, they, they see it good, good, good. But when they start to hear stories and accounts and research that talks about the process, how people change, it actually makes our public uh, a lot more, I believe, can add to the compassion of our public to give offenders a second chance. So this is an area I think we, we can exploit. If you look at a slide, most of us realize that we all need hope in our lives. But the research actually is telling us that these are important elements. Maruna's work talks about how the sisters tend to have a new, describe themselves differently. They see the world differently. You know, they, they, it's a sense of a new identity that they're living out versus those who come back to prison. I'll talk a little bit about it in a bit more detail later. This is what we call from the literature that are important from the desistance research. The idea of hope is not some airy-fairy belief that I want to be somebody one day. It's more than that. It's also having both the desire to do something and the ability and the capacity to do it. And the desistance are also telling us that, you know, hope helps them to... Uh, to buffer them from a lot of the things that they go through, that without that sense of hope, um, life can be very dismal for them. So when, when we started re looking at the hope literature, um, it really resonates with what we're trying to do in terms of the Yellow Ribbon campaign, giving them a sense that the public accepts them. But also it really challenges the captains of life in prison to be uh, the harbingers of hope, the, the people that will bring, that would be holding the light for them. Is that idealistic? I don't think so. I think um, <coughs> the inmates, prob our inmates probably see our officers many hours during the day. They see a psychologist a couple of times a week. They see a volunteer a couple of hours a week. But by and large, our officers are really the ones in most contact. And they're the ones that will, could make or break a lot of whether people will still hold on to hope or will give up to them. Even the way they speak to our offenders would be actually something that will influence the way they perceive the world. I think when we started Yellow Ribbon uh, many years ago, it wasn't because we had desistance research or we had good lives. It was something that came out from the belief of the prison system about some people who had an enlightened vision of what goes ahead. Looking back, if you remember the song, uh, Thai Yellow Ribbon, uh, Tony Orlando's song, you know, it can accept me when I come home. Uh, that message, I think, still is very powerful. And I think... Hearing from the inmates who were with us when Yellow Ribbon first started, they started to realize that if the public is willing to give them a go, what are they going to do about it themselves? Uh, it's quite good this year because during the National Day speech, the Prime Minister actually mentioned the Yellow Ribbon in his speech. So that went out televised throughout the whole country. So people hear about it uh, at the highest level of political endorsement. <coughs> Something that happens when people come to prison, you just lose your freedom. Um, and with it come the loss of agency. And I take a step back and I say that, you know, as, as we progress 
we start to have good computer systems. We can computerize all our LSI, CMI scores, LSI scores. We can computerize everything. After a while, what happens to me seems to be that it, we can easily come to a very technocratic, efficient system, which is important. But the offender's life rests in the computer. <laughs> how, do, how do we bring what is in the information back to the inmates in such a way that they have some ownership of it? That is their life we are talking about. I think psychiatry uh, uh, faces the same issue when you have a medical system that tries to help people to recover from mental illness. and. We can rehab the person, but the recovery of the person is really their own journey. How do we bring that power back to them? Um, we struggle with that uh, because uh, there is a Singapore is a supposedly efficient country. But one of the challenges for us is how do we translate the efficiency into such a way that the individual person actually experiences that uh, momentum for change and that they have an ownership of their own rehab journey. So one of the things for us is that while we have nice computer systems, is how do we make those information a live document for them, bringing the root map, getting them to journal some of their thoughts, making the plans personally meaningful, encouraging conversations where the person whose plan, they can hold on to the plan and maybe talk to their families about it. Uh, I used to work in forensic mental health in New Zealand, and one of the most powerful things we, we were able to do was to get the families involved and talk to the families together with the patient, his rehabilitation plan, and, and get the support there, where it's no longer some document that you hold that's printed from a computer, but it's something that the person feels that is part of them. This is Tony Watt's uh, primary goods. These goods are the very things that most of us can aspire, want in our life. So how do we make uh, in within prisons, uh, um, with the conversations we're having with our offenders, our inmates, to get them to talk about, to identify what is important for them uh, of all the different goods that they may be drawn to for them to identify, to have a space to talk about it, and not only that, for them to write it down somewhere so that as they go through the journey within prisons and as they even when they leave prison, whatever they feel to be the primary group that is very important for them, we can come back and talk to them about it. Because there'll be times when they feel like giving up. There are times when they just say they're going through a divorce, the father just died, the mother, the wife, disappears, the husband disappears, the children die, whatever. How, how can we continue that conversation in such a way that not just the specialists doing it, but uh, those who are in the probation work, those who are in the aftercare supervision work, how can we incorporate that into a supervision plan? <coughs> that a good life is one of the important aspects that need to be dealt with. Firstly, more as a motivation and as a sense of hope and as a something that will give a person a reason to continue. The other area that really is um, that I think we are learning a lot more about is this idea of the narrative identity uh, that that is really coming up from Maruna's uh, initial work with the Liverpool Resistance Group. And if we take it further, um, in the RNL literature, we talk about cognitive restructuring, we talk about engaging them to talk about problem solving. We, these are important skills to learn. And that's where the evidence base is actually telling us. But I think that we can go a, a step further to actually get our offenders to really look at their, their, their sense of identity. Who am I? Um, one of the interesting things when we talk to offenders, offenders will, can see themselves, I'm a prisoner. I'm an offender. And that's according to uh, just having a conversation with my, one of my psychology colleagues. The identity that many prisoners talk about themselves is the collective us, we are prisoners. They don't talk about me as a person, not as much. So part of the rehab journey for us could be how can we then 
help them to restructure and reconstruct an identity that is meaningful for them. This came out also from the Liverpool Dissistance Study that the persistence, those who came back to prison in that study, seem to have what we call a, in their narrative about themselves, a condemnation script. There's a lot of blaming somebody else for their problem. They don't see a lot of control about where their lives are going. They see themselves somehow doomed to failure. But the, the sisters, on the other hand, have a sense of empowerment about their lives. And what, what, I, what really struck me was some of them wanted to be fathers, but they don't just want to be fathers. They really want to be good fathers. They, it wasn't just I wanted to be a, a, a good person. I wanted to contribute to it. There was almost a certain missionary zeal about some of these people when they talk about where they were going. And, and when, I speak, when we speak to some of our ex-offenders who are working in the halfway houses, helping other offenders to rehabilitate and reintegrate, <clears throat> you find the same kind of scripts coming up, the same sense of mission. And it started to realize that it, it's not just about fixing the guy's problem, fixing his thinking, fixing his deficits. It's about how do we bring life to people I think that's where faith-based groups do have a lot to play because I think they, they are pretty good at igniting that flame. And if we work alongside them and somehow integrate what we are doing, I think we can achieve a lot more. Now, as we were reading the decisions literature, we, uh, some, another development that came into prisons was we actually, in our violence treatment program, we use a program called The Man Alive which was actually from San Francisco jail. Uh, Chad Banu of Hamish Sinclair shared how Men Alive is a program that came out from violent men who learn how to be non-violent. It is not strictly a CBT program, but it has a lot of CBT elements in it, cognitive behavioral elements in it. But what's interesting in that violence program is we help the guys to look at the offending, their violence, in terms of their male role in the in the in their lives, uh, it's a male role belief system, and many of the we 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 get the guys to identify how they see themselves. And one of the things that come come out in that program is this co thing called the hitman. <coughs> if I'm a violent man, in fact, I don't need to be that violent to have a hitman identity. If you insult me or challenge my manhood in any way. All of you will know if you work with offenders that that's where prison fights usually come up from. Where the male ego is being challenged, the hitman comes up and takes over everything else. And then there's a desire and a need to, <coughs> to maintain the hitman image so that you don't feel small. But as we deconstruct what the hitman is about, <coughs> we also introduce to the, to the men in the group the idea that um, there's another part of you. And interestingly, many violent men actually say there is another part of them that don't want to be violent. But because violent means power to them, how do I separate that out? That there is a, a, they call it, we call it the authentic true self. And we actually split it. And over time, as the men go through the violence program and they can look at their narrative identities quite differently and learn the skills of not being violent, their it gives them a sense of purpose. What happens, Hamish shared with us, was when they deconstructed the violence and brought it into the hitman without developing the authentic self, the men became depressed. <laughs> Violent men started to go into depression. So this positive part has to be built. So our question is, can we do that for our other criminogenic programs? <coughs> So what we did was we re-looked at some of our CRIM programs. We continue to use the r, &R principles to inform our criminogenic programs. We bring in a discussion about good lives in terms of the primary goods at the beginning of our programs so that we, the, the, the chaps can identify what the, good, the goods, the primary goods that they need that could sustain them. 
then what we do is this slide will, will look, it is both a cognitive restructuring exercise, but we get the guys to go through this circle, we write it down on the board. We also get the chaps to deconstruct, when I'm doing crime, what kind of identity do I have? And as they go through the cycle a few times, what they learn is that there is an alternative, that if I want to learn, I can learn all the skills of not doing crime, I can learn all the cognitive skills, but we get them to reflect further on where they are at in their life, how do they see themselves as persons. So this idea of social identity becomes quite an important part. So we're trying to incorporate both the r, &R principles, some of the good life uh, elements, plus a desistance focus on making sure that the, the element of hope is being brought into it. How? By looking at where they are going with their lives, by returning to the good lives aspects as they go through, say, a, a six to nine month program. And the next thing we need to work with our correctional officers to understand that they can actually enter into conversations about all, any of these elements as the guys go through the groups. This is one of the uh, new thinking they were trying to bring together. Uh, it's, we're just piloting this new approach to this. Uh, because of what we learn both from the literature and from our work with violent men and trying to incorporate that into our criminal thinking programs. Um, the other part of the systems work that uh, has captured some of imagination is also the uh, interesting to describe like a lot of the skills building work as human capital investment in people, building up their skills, the problem solving skills, the moral reasoning skills. But there's another part that is the social capital, the, the networks that our offenders have, the, the inmates have. And in many ways, the social capital of most of our people in our system is pretty poor. They don't have the good job networks. They only have the antisocial peer networks. So one of the things the systems is telling us is that, reminding us that we're, we probably already know, is that as we follow people up in the community, there needs to be uh, that whatever scaffolding we do for people has to be individualized to the person. And I think everyone in the room kind of know that this is important, but somehow when we craft systems of supervision and aftercare support, we can forget that that happens. And the literature is also telling us that the relationship between, say, the probation officer and the uh, person who is trying to make good is highly important, especially to build a relationship of trust. Um, that really impacts on how we uh, train our probation officers, and how we train our officers who are doing aftercare support, and how we tr help the volunteers, not just bring in the, the skills part is very important, which I think uh, in uh, equip our people to follow people up, but it's also those relationship aspects, and the critical moments when they need more help. So these are some of the things that the, the systems literature is actually helping us as, I think, Singapore, as we go along developing our community support and training our care network partners, sharing our disinformation to care network partners. Uh, I think there's a lot of excitement in this. Well, these are the few things that if you forget everything I said during this presentation, I hope these can be some of the takeaways that you can bring away with you. For me, I think uh, having worked in the system for years, I think holding up hope is a pretty important thing. I think we can lick that one. Uh, all the human capital stuff and the social capital stuff will come together. With that, uh, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hold our questions till the end so that we give enough time to both speakers. Um, Rutger Krabbendam is the program manager of the modernization program of the Dutch Prison Service, and his topic is on the focus on aftercare, part of that effort, and preparing prisoners for return to society. There's been some interesting statistical 
occurrences from what they've already put in place, and I think they'll probably discuss some of those, some positive uh, trends that have resulted a lessening, for example, in the, the level of psychiatric care needed uh, for some prisoners and uh, uh, lessening in violence tendencies and so forth. So I think uh, we will uh, hear from him about a variety of things going on in the total modernization of that system. Okay. Can I put this out? All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Edgar Krabbendam. I'm program manager. Okay. It's the modernization of the Dutch prison service system. Um, I give a presentation. Thanks for that. We are glad that we can tell you the story about the Dutch prison systems. Uh, uh, we have more occasions this week, and we're glad that we can tell a lot about what we're doing. Uh, first today, aftercare reintegration activities, but also on Thursday, and then we talk about the motivating treatment and the provisional supervision. So how we train our staff. Uh, we have. Uh, And we have uh, uh, very good results in training the staff and see how the inmates are reacting on it. So on Thursday, we can show you some statistics, uh, uh, how everything uh, uh, goes well in Holland. And we, and we are talking about psychiatric, psychiatric and somatic care in the Dutch Penal Prison in, on Thursday. For now, we take it on aftercare. That's my focus right now. First and second figure. Then our vision strategy, then the coherent approach to aftercare, and at the end, promoting motivation for a change. So those are the two sides. One is that we should take care for the prison, so we arrange a lot of things for them. But the other side is that we want to, the prisoners to arrange a lot of things by themselves, and we should support them. So both sides of the same coin, metal, we are training them to. Okay, what's very spe specific in Holland is that when you see the incoming numbers, they are decreasing at this moment. So the, we don't have the last figures, but we see that we decrease the incoming numbers. When you see our capacity, it first grows and now we get declines. So after, in the last three or four years, we closed about three or four prisons in the Netherlands. What's also very specific about the Dutch situation is that when you see the uh, period they are in detention, we have a lot of short sentences. And when you see at 2009, and you take the first two on the other side, then you see that almost 70% of our prisoners will stay at most three months. So we have to deal we have a lot of short sentences, and we have a lot of people coming in and out. When you see our recidivism in two years, it's 21% after a year, 33 after two years. But when you see six years, it's still 70%. So there's a lot of work to do. And the work we're doing, we have about 26 prisoners, prisons in Holland, 43 locations, and we work about 13,000 MPs. And those are the situation of in Holland. Okay. For well, about five years ago, four years ago, we made a clear vision, and that vision, that vision still helps us a lot, because all the uh, 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 different factors or influence our work, the vision keeps us going straight forward. And we have five uh, complex tasks we have to solve. First of all, the cooperation between the chain parts and the prison systems. We should intensify that. Second, the work climate. We're going to change that. We have a population change. The 
care, and people who need care are getting grow, growing bigger, the, the amount of them. We got the capacity variations. You saw that we are closing prisons. And for about three or four years, we had 1,000 1, or 2,000 empty cells. So we have to change uh, our capacity management. And we have to, at this moment, everybody stay alive. We got to cut costs. So. And we have made a vision by this model. We have a higher aim, an ambitions aim, we have core values, and we have core qualities. And the most important things are that now cooperation with our partners and reintegration is our higher aim. So we work on the reduction of recidivism, but we want to have an individual orientated approach. We want taking and granting responsibility by the prisoners and we put a lot of effort in our motivational treatment. So those are the main things we do. And our focus is now on the de detainee. And what we do is we standardize our screening procedures. In every location we work it on the same way. We faced a more individual oriented approach. So every prisoner got a supervision plan where the insight is also what we should do for his resocialization. We have staff with more proactive support and we, collaborate, we have collaboration with our chain partners. And this is all what the program looks like. And the red arrow, that's the central thing. So every prisoner has his own plan and from the screening, we see if he can be more or less guarded or he takes more care. And we can focus on which subjects or where, which, uh, 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 which things should be in his daily program. So now we're trying to make every, every uh, detainee his own red arrow. Okay. And then aftercare. At the end of 2007, we started a program about aftercare. We had a higher rate of recidivism. The justice and the municipalities were different worlds. The prison centers was an isolated intervention. There was no welcome committees after release. And we had a complex target group. And everybody got the same problem, I think. We have a multi-problem. And the problems on the five basic provisions, where the 20% had problems with their accommodation when they're getting in. 40% had problems with their income, no income. 20% had uh, no ID when they are arriving in the prison. 70% had serious financial problems, debts. And about 30 had contact with healthcare institutions. So, and when you look at these problems, then there was even a big group about 14% or 4884 has problems on one of the five, 30% on debts, and 14% has even problems on three of these five issues. So it's a very big problem and it's always multi-problem. When we started the program, we set a goal, and our goal was to have a significant contribution the social participation of former detainees and to reduce the recidivism. And we make uh, 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 appointments with our uh, uh, chain partners with the municipalities about that 80% of the formerly detained citizens should have, when they discharge from detention, should have a valid proof ID, they should have income, employment, or social security. They, we have insight in depth, sometimes a depth reschedule plan, with accommodation or housing, and we have suitable, suitable addiction care or psychiatric care. So we have a, an agreement with uh, 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 lots of municipalities in Holland on, this, uh, on these targets. And, we saw, and this is how our partners were involved. Prison service systems, probation, 
municipalities, healthcare, social security, associations for debt relief, social banking, and housing companies. And we focus, in our Dutch approach, we focus on the five main areas. They are forming the biggest risk. We look at our problem as a whole, the prisoner, and we start very early. So when a uh, detainee arrives in prison, in the first five days, we make contact with the municipality where he's, com he is coming from. And then we start to change information. And we're filling our file we, and we make the first plan what to do. And that's in the first five days. And we see the imprisonment just not as a breach block, but as a, a, a phase in a running career, like the life course criminology. And we have to change our role for the prisons. We get more network orientated, and facilitating and demand orientated. So when you have a lot of short sentences, you can't do the whole thing by yourself. So it's very important that you have a network of surrounding you. We make for every detainee a plan individual detention reintegration plan and we do that in close cooperation with our social institutions our challenges because it's, it's it's easy to write it down but it's hard to get it realized our challenges is that we have 29 prisons uh, for more than 400 municipalities so we have to deal with a lot of lot of different parties Although we want to reach 80% of the detainee, that we have a plan, and we have, when, when they leave prison, we have all the five basic provisions they are taken care of. It's not yet so far, but now the information to exchange starting getting better all the time. Problem is the financing. When we are starting all the new activities, who's gonna pay the bill because we can do all the things in our daily program, but when we're getting more and more activities, and we, we also like to have a contribution from the, our par, from the, our, uh, the chain partners. And what we like most is when the chain partners, that we don't take care of the activities, but our chain partners come inside and take care of the activities. And that's a, a, a stage to take, that's not yet realized. And the detention capacity, capacity is sometimes far from the social environment of the prisoners themselves. So when you make an arrangement with a, a, a city like Amsterdam, but the prisoners they, we, we are talking about are about uh, 200 miles away from Amsterdam, it's very hard to get the institutions of the city of Amsterdam to visit their own prisoners and help them because the distance is too far. So it's all for us, it's all also uh, that we should manage that the prisons should be uh, uh, placed in the region where they return or where they're coming from. So the first results we have is in all prisons, we have social service employees. We have 140 of these employees. And they take care of the exchange of the information and they always tell the uh, municipalities, this prisoner at this moment is here and what, and what do we know about him when we leave prison and so we are constantly in contact with our municipalities. We have an uh, uh, information exchange that's on a digital platform. So every municipality can, on, can exchange information digital with us. So they fill in the files. So what we want to know, we said this one is uh, in, now uh, in custody with us. Can you give out the information? And they fill in the files digital try to reach, you know, place our detainees near the social environment to which they return. And we have more and more inpatient activities integrated in our daily program. Okay. And uh, uh, in Holland, we, about four or five years ago, uh, we only had reintegration intervention for persons with a longer sentence. But as you saw in the statistics, we have only 17% with a longer sentence. So a, a big group had no reintegration activities. They followed the daily program with all the things as sports and so on, but there were no special reintegration activities. So now we have to change our system 
and we have, we have to focus more on the people with short sentences. And that's why the connection with our chain part is getting more and more important. Well, this is a site where you can say that we take care for the prisoners. Uh, we make relations to the municipalities. We take care of five basic provisions they want. We try to give them a house when they leave uh, uh, our prisons. We try to arrange uh, income and everything we try to do for them. But the most important thing is the other side, is that we motivate them to do things themselves and to motivate them to promote, uh, the, the, the motivate them to change. And this is a, a new way of thinking at this moment that we start. And it also comes from the same theory and background that Tim just explained. It's the process of desistance and moving away from crime over the time. So how can we support that? So how we can assist offenders to move beyond a motivational ambivalence? Change doesn't occur without a reason. So what we see now is that when prisoners come into our prisons, we don't ask them any questions. They pack out their things and go to the, our daily program, uh, walk a bit around, see if there are other friends who are also detainee at that moment. But we don't automatically ask the question, do you want to stop with crime? And we think that we should, everybody who gets inside in our prison, we should, everybody, we should ask that question. So, so we, we, we should create a motivational conflict. And we think that detention is always a kind of occasion that people start to think, what should I do right now? So we should use that moment much better than we use it right at this moment. So, we, so that he can make reflective or a little bit choices and decisions. What should I do? What, my, uh, what are my advantages as a prisoner? Uh, what are my disadvantages? And we sort of assuming that he assuming the role of a changed person. Okay, so our main aim is to promote the motivation for change. And that's our main aim. And when you have this uh, kind of changing in attitude to detention, what we have, that has a lot of complications. And uh, on our staff, because our staff should act in a different way, on our daily program, should organize our daily program different, and it has to do with developing new activities. And we use, uh, uh, and we at this moment, all our staff is trained in MI, motivational interviewing. On Thursday, I will tell you more about it. And we used a model and it's from Prohaska di Clemente. And it's about that it started that people don't want to think about stop of crime. Then they may think about it. Then they decide, they decide to it and they take action and so on. And with our short sentences, we can't uh, uh, follow the whole circle. But we still think that it's our task to start the circle with everyone who is in our hands. So, and then the first three steps are the most important steps to create a change identity shift. And what's very important for our, for our staff is that when you want to motivate the detainees, it started just with the first contact. So the whole system should be, uh, 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 should be uh, believing in that we are a, a factor who can help them change. So in our supporting the, and assisting the detainee, at the first moment he arrives, we should have a motivating way to, uh, uh, have, uh, uh, to have a relationship on a more motivating way. And we used to have only interventions for longer sentences, but we think that even short interventions on the right, uh, uh, right uh, circumstances can cause changes. So now we're, making, uh, we're building new instruments also for the people who are staying very short, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks in our prison. Okay. So when you see our schedule, then we got an inflow. And in the first month, we inform them, we instruct them, we motivate them, and we change information with our, uh, our chain partner. And this, this is even for conviction. So we started 
also where are the, all the prisoners in the remand prisons. Then we have two new instruments with a reflector and with a personal plan. Because the first plan we make after a month, then the focus is on safety, on care. Where can we settle the, the detainee? But we don't know much about the socialization yet. And what we try to do is that in a lot of prisons, you see that we always talk about the prisoners, but we don't talk, but we don't talk with him, or uh, we make plans about him, but we don't make plans with him. So we try to uh, 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 incorporate two instruments who force us that the, uh, the, 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 our detention education plan will become more a personal plan. It becomes his plan, and that's our, that, 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 that's our goal, to make the, per, the plan his plan. And so we have two instruments, the reflector and the personal plan. And what you see a lot is that we, uh, we normally you start uh, exchanging information, then you see what, the, what he has, uh, what his situation is, only five basic provisions, like he has no income, he has debts and so on. And you directly start on, on, the, on, 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 the, on the lower side to give him the activities he wants. But we think it's very important that you stay in the middle for a while and that you make the plan with the detainees themselves. So these two instruments, I, I will tell you a bit about it. First is the reflector. And the reflector is, uh, 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 they fill in themselves and, it's, uh, uh, and they reflect on two things and they are very important. When somebody, somebody wants to change, two things should be in order. And his personal resources should be in order in order, his motivation, his uh, stress, uh, his optimism, his self-efficacy, everything should be in order by himself. And the other thing with what should be in order is his social resources. And when d these two things are not in order, there's a big chance that the, his change of motivation will not occur or will not succeed. So we ask him to fill in to fill in 160 questions in 30 minutes. And then he tells about himself what he thinks that his situation is. So then we had in the fourth, first five days, we get all the information of the municipalities. There are some statistics, you know, what we know about him. And when he wants to go further with us, then he fill in the reflector by himself. Okay. And the second thing, what we have is that we are now, we have an, uh, a book and it's a self book, and uh, it's written in Dutch, but I have an English sem seminary, here, seminary here. And that's, uh, uh, that's about how we train them next to the self book, where are a lot of exercises in. And the subjects are first, the change of mind in do you really want to stop? So we, we ask them. Which side do you want to choose? What sort of disadvantages advantages? Then we go to the personal goals, what do you want to achieve? And then we ask them, what brings you back all the time? What we should we solve so that you can deal with your problems more systematically? And those three elements, we train them in. And then we ask them, what, you, what, what should you do? And in, in, in what order should you do it? So we have our own ideas about his history and what he should do, but we also ask him to define his idea of in what order he should take care of his problems. And uh, we're building this system now, so we didn't test it in, in, in a broad way, but we test it on the circle spots. And what we see when you, uh, uh, when you are motivating people to change and you give them a self book, and you give them training afterwards, it enhances the motivation. They like it to have attention on their problem, and they like to work on it. And, uh, and, and the other side is what, it, what happens, is that our professional, professional staff likes it very much because they hate to be only the guard, and they like to assist and to help uh, uh, the detainee. So it's, it, it works on both uh, uh, sides. Okay, and the result is, as I said before, then we get a reflector, then we get the results of the change, uh, of the second instrument, choose for change, and then we get a more a personal plan. And 
And when we have the personal plan, then we, then we go to the lower side and then we choose what kind of activities should the, should the detainee follow. So for us, th at this moment, the, the, the middle section to make a plan with the detainee is our focus right now and we're building on that, uh, that system. Okay, till so far. We have uh, time for questions. Um, I'll have a few announcements before you start to leave, but uh, let's go ahead with any, any questions of either speaker. And there's microphones in the center, if you care to come up to the microphones in the center aisle. Yes, Steve. My name is Steve. My name is Steve Carter from the United States. I noticed that in both uh, Tim and Ruckler's presentation that you started with statistics that indicated a decrease in your prison population. We have also been experiencing that in uh, uh, most of the major areas within the United States. What I'd like to know from both of you is the reasons that you're seeing for that decrease in prison population. And the second aspect of that is to uh, how much do you attribute to the introduction of the kinds of programs that you have described today in that decrease in uh, population, and do you think you'll be able to sustain it? I do, I do understand the question. Uh, first, it's, sometimes it's very hard to explain the, uh, the decline. Um, one, one of the things we, uh, we have, uh, uh, in, in a certain time, we had a lot of uh, um, drug-related crimes and the import of drugs in, in Holland. And we have, uh, at that moment, and we, we started to uh, have better control at our, uh, out, uh, our boundaries, you know, at, at the airport and so on. And we see that a lot of uh, drugs important crime uh, declined. So that, that's also uh, uh, on, on more on the harder uh, side. On the softer side of all our uh, instruments we're now introducing, we don't have the results yet. So that's, that's a bit, uh, that's, that's more difficult to explain. What we have results on motivational interviewing, and we can show you on Thursday, we will show you that what we have invested in our staff and, and the results on how the uh, data needs to react on it. And that's a direct correlation between them. So that's very positive. But we don't know how these instruments are working because it's still uh, in pilots and not a, a, a general system already. Timothy? Um, we don't have the, uh, the research stats to actually make a causal link between everything that we are doing that leads to our dropping uh, recidivism rate uh, over the years. Our hypothesis or our guess is that um, uh, it's a combination of the laws, the enforcement uh, in Singapore over the years, plus what's been happening over in prisons itself. We, we suspect that uh, both the changes within the prison system, the way we are putting our programs into place, the way the community partners are coming in to uh, help us, the increase in the number of people giving employment, I think these all add up. So one of the areas we are looking at would be how do we uh, get better data and research to support some of the changes that we are seeing, or at least to, to show us in more clearer detail. But it's a quite a complex um, issue. Um, we, we are currently uh, fortunate in the sense that the public has got confidence in the prison system and, a, and in the law. And that actually enables us to do quite a lot of work. Uh, if we had a very difficult, untrusting politician or untrusting public, we would have a greater 
difficulty to put in some of the things that we are moving. Uh, one of the challenges we have would be how do we then balance between the prisoner not getting more than, perceived to be getting more than what the public is getting. And, and we manage that as sensitively as we can. Uh, so in, in a sense, if you come into a Singapore prison and you do a prison visit, we, we, the prisoners live in a re very Spartan kind of environment. And that allows us, the, in, in a sense, a moral mandate to do a lot of the things we do without uh, two things. One is that we keep prison safe so people feel safe coming into prison and when they leave, uh, we do a lot of work to maintain public confidence in us. I think that's another area that uh, I think is something that we, we've been working hard and I think we've been blessed with that. Thank, thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm uh, Dion von Sale, inspecting judge in the Judicial Inspectorate for Correctional Services uh, in South Africa. Um, we have 241 prisons operational at the present stage, 160,000 inmates. About a third of those are awaiting trial detainees or remand detainees. At virtually every prison we have a psychologist, and listening to the psychological approach which you have been propagating, I, I have an, an idea that none of our psychologists is specifically trained for the approach that you have propagated today. And the question that comes up immediately is, is there some way or another, some kind of program which one is able to uh, make available to our psychologists so that they can adopt this approach. Otherwise, it's just an academic question. Thank you. Um, perhaps I could clarify your question. When you say the approach, uh, generally our psychologists, we, we have them trained in just, in terms of the basic model that we run would be the risk needs responsibility model. Uh, there are training available. There are people who, who do training internationally. Uh, we've had some of the training come from overseas and we've sent people uh, and, and we, 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 we learn along the way as well. So it follows the, the literature on risk needs responsibility. So anybody who is actually trained in mental health and psychology can pick those skills up quite easily. It's a matter of reading the right literature, getting supervision from people. Um, a lot of the other kinds of work that we're trying to do would be then how, after having kind of get gotten the the skills in using the risk needs responsibility model, how, how can we, uh, we're, we're still learning along the ways of using narrative in, in the work that we do, uh, building up and deconstructing an identity that's criminal and trying to develop, help our chaps to develop a more pro-social kind of uh, identity for themselves. That's something that we are learning along the way, and, and a conference like this means that we meet people that... And, and it's interesting because when I... I just got to know Rutger just now, and, and what he's doing is something that I'm very interested in. <laughs> so we are learning off each other that way, yeah. Um, thank you. So in our vision, it's not only the work of the psychologists. So we, we, we see all the different staff members should enter on a different way. We have the uh, uh, CO who, who is a mentor of the uh, uh, detainee who should help him with all his questions. And the questions are, how, how is your education going? Uh, can I help you a bit more? Uh, and so on. And we have uh, special trainers to train them in the programs. And we have uh, uh, other, we call it ser service employees. Who follow? Who look at the detention track? If everything goes uh, by plan, so the, the, the most important thing is that everybody in, in the whole prison staff are have their all have their focus on how important motivation is, and then they all can play a different role. Uh, but we don't certainly don't focus on the on the psychologists because that's 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 uh, we have a very 
a good healthcare program, and then Thursday you can hear more, more about that. But we, on the normal uh, detainee, and he f that follows a regular program, we are training everyone in motivational interviewing, and we try to uh, uh, make a, a, a kind of a description for how, how how the work looks like for every staff member. So we're not focusing on one particular group of uh, professionals. And, 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 that's, and, that's, and that's, I think that's the most, that, that, that's the best way of doing, impl implementing it. Just, Just a uh, yeah. reinforcing comment on that. I think what both systems here have said about the need to train any and all staff yeah. who have any contact with inmates whatsoever is, is very important. I, we've seen that in, in other countries, other systems, and it does make an incredible difference. One staff who is not consistent with what you're trying to do with that inmate can totally undo a significant amount of work and progress. It's, it's even, it's even we, we, we've seen that when you have uh, one hour with a psychologist or one hour with the specialist trainer in 24 hours a day, the rest is much more important because when the things they are establishing with the detainee is not continued in the other, other aspects of the daily program, then everything is uh, uh, done for nothing. The other, um, just, a, just a comment. Uh, um, we are also trying to teach or share the knowledge on r and &R with our community partners. So one of the things we hope to do is this, um, that as some of the community partners get to know about the risk needs responsive model, the good lives model, they can actually structure some of their people with the same skills and teach them that when you are helping an offender, whether your faith come from a particular faith or from a circular organization, uh, some of the thinking that the offender can come with or the uh, inmate can come with is, it's, some of the attitudes, they can actually pick it up and try and work with them in a, in a low-key way. So, um, so extending beyond staff would be the next level of influence, if you use the circle analogy of the ripple effect, would be to make sure that the, the knowledge is shared with the community as well. Uh, thanks. John. Hello, hello. Hi, Bob. Uh, that was a great uh, question, uh, Ian. It came right down uh, my alley. Uh, I'm uh, executive director of the International Association for Correctional and Forensic Psychology, and we'll be sponsoring a, a talk uh, on Wednesday. But in the meantime, uh, we publish criminal justice and behavior, which is uh, we publish the evidence that evidence-based is based on. And I'm here and I'm happy to consult with people and to help people. We're a nonprofit organization in the United States. We're the oldest association in service to uh, correctional mental health people. But we do, we focus on, uh, we've been publishing the R&R &R model uh, materials for years and years. Uh, all of the Prochaska and DiClemente stuff on stages of change and, and motivational interviewing, all of those kinds of things. So if you see me around and there's any way that I can be helpful, I'm, uh, I'm happy to go right down that uh, alley with you. Thank you. Other questions? Anyone? Ah, Javier. Thank you. Uh, Javier Bustamante from Peru. I'm very happy uh, to have heard both the speakers because usually uh, most of the people around me don't believe in the possibilities of rehabilitation. So the message always is, is a, a negative message. And so when we hear something so positive as this morning, uh, that really is, a, is a, like a breath of good air no, for our ears. And so I'm, I'm, I'm pleased of both speakers. I was just wondering, uh, with, the, with the figure that was mentioned first, uh, 70% in, in five years no, of recidivism, and then another 30% in, in two years. Uh, this, this is something that you have measured uh, again, no, this, the two years, and you are hoping 
that that will be the same case after seven years, so that you will, you have moved because because of these programs into a much lower level of recidivism at this point, or 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 you are not sure yet. No, this is uh, this is one question, and the other is that this very complicated process of deconstructing one identity to construct a new one. I was thinking if because all of this. Uh, new knowledge that you have, uh, if it's something that you are sharing much with the Department of Education, so to, as to help the students that they should build uh, identities that will not need to be deconstructed afterwards. Thank you. Sam. Uh, at the first question, we. We, me we measure every year, we measure the, uh, the, the figures on recidivism. And, uh, but we haven't met them, uh, uh, or we haven't, uh, uh, um, we, we haven't had the results at this moment where, where all our activities are still based on. So, so because we have started for two or three years now, and we should wait for about three or four or five years for if, if we will know the results. And then even it will be very hard to, uh, uh, when you, uh, to, uh, uh, yeah, to, to how you say, to which factor is the real, the real factor which helps him to stop with the crime. So, because there are lots of things and it's very hard to measure these things. So, this is always a very, very difficult uh, thing. Uh, I think we hope that the total program and all things we do will help. But it, sh it would be very hard in about four or five years to measure which aspect is the best aspect, uh, aspect in the whole, in the whole uh, uh, program, what we are doing now. So we are, we are talking a lot with our uh, institution who m will measure our program, but it's also that they are uh, telling us don't have to have big expectations for pronouncing what this will help on recidivism. And uh, so we are, we are now looking if the project is uh, uh, going well, we are getting, looking what the outcome is, but what the, the output on longer terms, it's very hard to predict. We are at lunchtime. Uh, and before we uh, go ahead though, let's uh, give our speakers a hand. I have a couple of gifts for them. Uh, thank you very much, Rector and Timothy. Let me just give you a couple of things here. Uh, lunch is uh, from 12.30 to 1.15. The next session start at 1.30. It'll be out here in the ballroom foyer, outside of this room. Uh, please remember to take all of your things with you. Uh, don't leave things in this room because we'll be probably rearranging. Um, also, let me remind you that uh, the Alexander Reamer, the uh, Russian, will be speaking on the Russian federal system, as we mentioned this morning in the opening session. That will be at 1530 today, and it is session W02. And I also want to mention that English is not Rutger's first language. I think he did an incredible job with a pure English uh, PowerPoint and presentation. So thank you, Rutger, for that. Thank you for your attendance.